Well, we're sticking with babies, and um, the reason why I wanted to um, talk about fetal care centers is probably not because many of you will ever have to do with anything in a fetal care center uh, or see patients that necessarily are fetal care center graduates. The reason why I wanted to talk about this is because this type of thing is something that keeps us at big American and some European children's hospitals that are embedded in academic medical centers uh, very busy and on a hard-working learning curve, and I thought it might be interesting for you to at least um, know this is going on, um, even though you may never have direct exposure to it. I, um, I showed you this picture before to um, still disclose no conflicts of interest, but I also mentioned that our children's hospital, who is um, who's emergency room corner you can see here, is on a campus where there is an adult university hospital and actually on the other side of Children's Hospital um, there is a Veterans Administration Hospital as well for um, American soldiers who need medical care after they um, have served in the military. So we have a big medical campus for all ages and we can walk from one institution to the other and for a fetal care center that's actually especially helpful as you'll hopefully see. So my objectives are to provide an update regarding the current state of fetal care centers in these types of uh, medical environments and to of course as a pediatric nephrologist to specifically discuss uh, what challenges us uh, in the context of these centers. Uh, what, so what is a fetal care center? Uh, once again it's typically some kind of multidisciplinary entity, usually uh, at, on these big medical campuses uh, within big medic academic medical systems. And when I say multidisciplinary, I've listed the uh, specialties that are typically involved in uh, the, these centers. There's a lot of radiology going on. Um, there is on the adult side high-risk obstetrics. Um, on the pediatric side, there are fetal and or pediatric surgical folks involved, and of course, uh, Scott's colleagues in the NICU from neonatology. Oftentimes, there's genetics uh, present, and then, of course, we get into this when there is a baby with severe urological and nephrological um, abnormalities, and the specialties that um, I marked with an asterisk are oftentimes lumped into what's called maternal fetal medicine. Um, these centers are referral centers for women who are pregnant with one or several babies with certain prenatally detected conditions, and I've listed some examples like congenital diaphragmatic hernia, spina bifida, twin-twin transfusion syndrome, or in our case when we are involved with some kind of pretty severe, oftentimes congenital abnormality of the kidneys and urinary tract, which we refer to as CACUT. And the way this works in the United States is that um, pretty much every pregnant woman has a screening ultrasound at around 18 weeks of pregnancy. And those ultrasounds, more often than not, are where these abnormalities are detected or at least strongly suspected that then may lead to a referral to a fetal care center. And the reason why I'm pointing out this um, timing of things is that by 18 weeks of pregnancy, the main urinary tract and renal development is already complete. So what you see on these ultrasounds at this time in terms of the kidneys and the urinary tract is what you get. On the other hand, oops, main lung development, main lung development uh, doesn't even start until several weeks after this 18 week ultrasound date and so if there's something that can be done to promote lung development based on this, um, these, any kind of ultrasound findings at 18 weeks, there's still a window of opportunity. So in, in these fetal care centers, we see a lot of women at 19 or 20 weeks of pregnancy based on these 18-week ultrasound results, and we have a lot of discussions about 
are there options to help lung development because something has been identified that could interfere with this upcoming lung development that doesn't start until the early 20-week phase of pregnancy. And so to, to put some uh, personal meat into this presentation and make it more, um, more clear, I, I got permission from one of my old patients named Max. Um, that's Max several years ago from my, um, my time in Cincinnati where we also had a fetal care center just like we do in, um, in Colorado now. And I met Max before he was born um, in, in the fetal care center there um, at a consultation that, which is pretty typically the case, included a maternal MRI. And what you're seeing here is mom's trunk and her uterus with Max in it. Um, what you're only seeing on these MRIs is fluid that's white, and so this is urine in mom's bladder. What you're not seeing, here's the placenta, there's Max's brain. What you're not seeing in the uterus is any amniotic fluid, which is why Max was referred for a consultation or, and his parents. That's mom's spine, by the way, right here. And then as you go through these MRI images, you still don't find any amniotic fluid, but you start finding a lot of urine in Max's bladder. And then if you use your imagination, you see that this bladder looks a little bit like a keyhole. And the keyhole sign is on these studies what strongly suggests that there's a bladder outlet obstruction like posterior urethral valves. And as you slice um, through the MRI, you see a more bladder uh, that's disproportionately enla enlarged and um, seems to be obstructed at the base of the bladder. And then you see on top of the bladder, which is now out of the plane of the MRI, you see these massively hydronephrotic kidneys, again consistent with uh, urine being hung up all the way up into the kidneys from this bladder outlet obstruction. That's Max's brain, by the way. Again, here's the placenta, just for orientation. So Max and his family embarked on a um, journey because that was offered to them, and they chose to go that route. There are other options, but here's Max's journey. A few days after this MRI, the bladder was prenatally decompressed. Um, again, why? Because there was urine. It just wasn't coming out. And you need urine to make amniotic fluid at this point, and you need amniotic fluid for lung development. And so um, the bladder was decompressed with a prenatal procedure. And um, then things went quite well for the, almost the rest of the pregnancy. There was a little bit of um, early delivery. And a few days soon after, delivery, obviously, there was a vesicostomy place to bypass that bladder outlet obstruction and, um, uh, and um, uh, provide ways to have, have urine come out. Um, I should add that we now know that doing these prenatal um, bladder decompression procedures have only one purpose, and that is to provide amniotic fluid and promote lung development. They do nothing for renal, Im improved renal development or improved renal function because, as I said, most of the damage is already done because of that much earlier urinary tract and kidney development that is basically over by 18 weeks um, uh, gestational age. Um, <clears throat> so Max had urine and he had some kidney function and um, unfortunately he didn't have very much, but at least it bought him, um, it bought him uh, a month without needing dialysis, but in the second month of life, his numbers had become pretty dangerous, and so he got a peritoneal dialysis catheter, and peritoneal dialysis was started still quite early in the life of a baby, especially a baby that was born um, somewhat premature and didn't weigh so much at birth. Um, PD was initiated in his second month of life. Um, our usual packet postnatally that comes with, um, with these complex babies is that they usually are not able to eat adequately for, for normal growth, so they need some kind of nutritional support. Um, and so he got a G-tube as well. His was combined with a Nissen, which 
was probably not such a good idea. We've learned from these things by now. Um, and overall, Max stayed in the hospital for five months before being big enough and set enough and the family trained enough to take him home at five months of age to do home peritoneal dialysis until he's big enough for a kidney transplant. And um, of course, that home stay didn't go smooth. There were all kinds of complications that required rehospitalization. Um, but eventually, we like for our babies, when they get kidney transplants, to weigh at least eight, ideally at least 10 kilos. So at, in his third year, early in his third year of life, Max got a kidney transplant. His mom was able to be his living donor. He weighed about 12 kilos at the time. And things went well overall. So later on, until um, he was bigger and on less immunosuppression, he was able to have his vesicostomy closed and have a metrophenov placed. So he um, has continued to do well. Actually, his transplant function remains quite good a number of years out from transplant. His bladder is being emptied through his metrophenov with a catheterization pro program. And from a developmental standpoint, he's actually doing quite well. Um, as you can imagine, we develop very close relationships with these families because we take so much complicated care uh, of them over the years. I actually, before I moved to Denver, went to a baseball game with Max and his family, and it was really cool to see him enjoy, um, enjoy that. And then the family um, also were troopers because usually if you have such a complicated and sick child, I always tell these families, if both of you work, one of you is gonna lose his or her job because the child is gonna become your job, um, which happened in this family too, but they were still able to, um, to come up with siblings for Max and um, send us a Christmas card several years ago to um, document that. Um, now from a programmatic and an institutional standpoint, this, almost crazy amount of care these babies and families require early on in life is quite a burden and quite a challenge. But if you look at this from a, like I said, institutional perspective, um, the institution gets a lot of return on any kind of, let's say, investment, for lack of a better work, that they make into these types of programs. What do I mean by that? Well, for, for instance, in Cincinnati, our number of kidney transplants as we did more fetal care um, increased in part because we transplanted a lot, not a lot, but an increased number of maxes, which are children age one to three, to three years, shown here as the, as the purple part of the column. So um, in somewhat recent at this vantage point years, those babies added a significant number to our overall number of kidney transplants. And that's only one major juncture. Um, if you look at it uh, on a more sequential way, there are multiple procedures that are generated by taking care of fetal care center graduates, as I, um, as I usually call them. They start with these prenatal interventions um, and um, then there is a pretty prolonged hospital stay, including a pretty prolonged NICU stay. Then there is the chronic dialysis until these kids are um, big enough to get transplanted. Then they not only get transplanted, but at institutions where there is a living donor program that's coupled with the overall transplant program, um, there's also a living donor who is being evaluated and eventually donates their kidney. And Many of these kids with congenital anomalies of the kidneys and urinary tract may also need additional urinary tract work to prepare them for a, a safe transplant. And then, of course, there's the post-transplant follow-up, um, the, the, the transplant itself, and then the post-transplant follow-up. So a whole sequence of quite um, sizable care that is triggered by each one of these fairly rare fetal, fetal care center graduates. Um, now, Max made urine and had urine, which um, is probably one of the reasons why he had such a good outcome, because babies who have bad kidney disease but still make urine in part because of their concentrating defects that 
a lot of these kids with obstructive uropathy have um, are so much easier to manage in terms of volume, in terms of hypertension, et cetera, et cetera, than say in this case, fetal care uh, patients who have aneuric conditions. What are aneuric conditions in that context? Obviously bilateral renal agenesis, um, bilateral multicystic dysplastic kidneys, we'll talk about them a little bit more later on, but a multicystic dysplastic kidney is a kidney that does not work, that is basically just a bunch of <laughs> like grapes looking cysts, and if you have that bilaterally, then you have no kidney function. And then unfortunately, and we have a baby with that in our hospital right now in, in Denver, severe early onset autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease can also be an aneuric um, condition in a baby. And so the only way those babies could not die is for some substitute of amniotic fluid um, to be provided iatrogenically because they don't make any urine that you can just get out of there and turn into amniotic fluid. So um, there are procedures that are termed amnioinfusions that basically mean if you see an aneuric prenatal medical condition, then um, you can do usually twice a week basically saline injections into the amniotic space to provide some fluid that will help with lung development. Um, and then of course things get a lot more complicated immediately after birth. You don't have that one or two months that Max had before you needed to start dialysis. These babies don't make any urine, have no kidney function, so they need dialysis right away, which is um, difficult to do and usually a stepwise process before you can establish peritoneal dialysis. In ARPKD, you usually need to take out one or both of these humongous kidneys. And then on PD, with no urine output, there are all kinds of potential complications that have, um, that have come to hurt us and the babies that have to do with really concentrating their formula and being aggressive in terms of how much fluid you try to remove with your peritoneal dialysis. Um, so um, there are dialytic modalities on the horizon to bridge these kids after birth, um, but they're not everywhere available, not even in the United States. They're not quite ready for prime time. There's pretty good ethical agreement about what comes with offering dialysis immediately after birth to a family for their aneuric baby, um, but there are uh, remaining challenges that are significant and that I would group in, in, in two or three categories. One is um, the whole regulatory stuff. What, it, what are amnio infusions? Are they experimental therapies? Are there research? We, we are in National Institute of Health sponsored trials about some of these things. Um, you know, every time you stick a needle into a pregnant mother's belly that comes with risk for the mother as well. And so um, who regulates this? What are, the, what are the ramifications? What's the framework for, for all of that? Um, what does this do not only to the family who, again, one family member definitely is going to lose his or her job. They, these fetal care centers are far and few between in the country, so these families may have to relocate, and they have a tremendous strain. Um, not just related to the baby, but also if they have other children, the, the parental relationship changes and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of strain on the teams because these kids are very complicated and very rare. So there's not much experience that you can gather and there's a whole tremendous need of communication and trying to understand each other when somebody like Scott in the NICU and somebody like me in nephrology try to take care of these babies with our teams. Um, and then, again, there is an uh, uh, ongoing debate about, um, you know, what are the ethics behind all of this? Should this be done? If it should be done, then where? Should there be a limited number of centers who at least have some expertise, or how do you do that? And then the whole who pays for this question remains somewhat unresolved as well. So um, anybody who's interested in reading more about this, I... Um, 
had an opportunity to write a review article about this uh, a year or two ago. Here's my email address if you want me to send it to you. Uh, but these are the key points basically summarizing what I just said in the previous slide. Thank you very much and shukran.